Welcome to Structure Fishing, I'm Jim Shell, and I'm going to present for you the Structure Fishing Workshop. But before I get into that, I want to tell you about the person that started it all, Buck Perry of Hickory, North Carolina. If you're not familiar with Buck Perry, let me tell you a little bit about him. Actually, this plaque that's up in uh, Hayward, Wisconsin, the uh, uh, Fishing Hall of Fame, describes Buck perfectly, and let me read it for you. It says, a son of the South and the father of structure fishing, he taught an entire continent the fundamentals of successful angling. He was the one that made possible the modern era of freshwater sport fishing. His discoveries and teachings have brought pleasure and success to millions of anglers, many of whom don't even know his name. He is the creator of spoon plugging, the total concept for successful fishing. He is the inventor of spoon plugs, lures which were designed to allow spoon plugging nows to be utilized to full advantage. He's a visionary, a pioneer, a scientist, a teacher, and a genius. He's quite an extraordinary man. Uh, so many dis Buck has made nearly all the discoveries in modern uh, day fishing. He's the one that coined the term structure, breaks, and break lines and gave it their original definition and meaning. And I can't wait till we get to that part of the workshop so we can clear that up because that term structure is so misused by 99% of the fishermen out there. So I can't wait to get to that part of the workshop. But uh, he's also the one that uh, was the first one to talk about how weather affected fishing, specifically a cold front. I think most of us associate a cold front with bad fishing, but Buck's the one that uh, uh, figured out why a cold front is bad fishing, and we're going to go over that in detail when we talk about weather and water conditions. Extraordinary man, and I was had the privilege of meeting him uh, back in 1989 at one of the first national jamborees. And 1990, here's a picture of Buck and I, uh, 1990 at, up at Lake Pepin. And I had the privilege and honor of spending four days with him at his house in Hickory, North Carolina, and worked in the uh, uh, spool plug uh, factory, which was a blast uh, back in, I think it was in 91. Uh, uh, great time, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Buck had passed away in 2005, and I'm excited to uh, share his material with you with this workshop here today. Uh, Buck has made a, a couple of books. Uh, this book here, here's a, a picture of my original book that I purchased many years ago. And that book is called Spoon Plugging, Your Guide in Lunker Catches. I believe the first edition was in 1969 or 72, somewhere around that time frame. And then later in, I believe in 81, 82, he came out with his nine volume home study course which most of this workshop is based on. Uh, both the book and the home study course can be purchased at Buck Bates, I'll put a link down below, or on Amazon. All right, now uh, the uh, spoon plugging or structure fishing is the total concept for successful fishing. And it's an understanding and knowledge of the basic movements of the fish, controls and tools, weather and water, structure, presentation of lures, and mapping interpretation. And we're going to start with the first phase of that in this part one of the workshop, the basic movements of the fish. Now we're going to say that a fish can be caught by most anyone, any place, on most anything, and most any method. We, can, we see it all the time on, you know, all, all fishing shows, guys on the YouTube, on the internet. You just, the people are pounding the bank and you don't, a straggler fish can be caught anything, anywhere, any method. But that's not what the Structure Fishing Workshop is about. This workshop is to show you and help you, teach you, and show you how to locate the school of adult fish and how to catch them consistently. We're not out there straggler fishing or anything like that. Uh, so if you and I expect to catch more and bigger fish, we must spend our time where we have the best chance to catch a fish. And if you and I expect to catch more and bigger fish consistently, we must be at the right place, at the right time, and fishing in the right manner. And that's what this whole workshop is going to go over, how to accomplish all that and arrive at the school of big adult fish consistently, too. Now, all of Buck's teachings, it works for all major game species of fish. It works for walleyes, smallmouth bass, bass muskies, northerns, white bass, striped bass, hybrid bass. It works for them all. 
There's some slight differences between the species of fish, but which we'll go over those little slight differences throughout this workshop here. But we have to pick a study fish. And Buck Perry says that our study fish is going to be the largemouth bass. And the reason he picked the largemouth bass is because he is the most difficult fish to catch consistently. He is affected the most by weather and water conditions than any other fish. They're all affected by weather and water, but the largemouth bass is more affected by that. So Buck says, if you can consistently learn how to catch the largemouth bass, you'll have no problem with all the other species of fish. And as we go out in this uh, workshop here, I'll discuss the slight differences between each species of fish as it uh, comes up. Now, here's a very important statement we're going to make. Anytime you see Buck says on that board there, pay attention and write it down. The first one is, Buck says that the home of the fish is deep water. When Buck first presented all this material and found that, you know, made it all, uh, discovered it all, I should say, back in the 40s and 50s, he was started preaching this, and the majority of the fishermen were laughing at him for everything that he was saying until he came back from the dock with big strings of fish, then they started listening. But when he first said the home of the fish is deep water, he wasn't taken well recepted by most of the fishermen. I think in the last 10, 20 years, a lot of fishermen have changed, and I think the majority of fishermen out there uh, uh, now understand that the home of the fish is deep water. If you're one of these fishermen that don't believe it or still think that the bass live up in the shallows behind a log and a stuff all year round, uh, have an open mind and believe this statement that the home of the fish is deep water. This one statement here, all the teachings, Buck Perry teachings, pretty much center around this one statement that the home of the fish is deep water. So it's important that you, if you don't believe this statement, that you have to believe it, at least during the course of this workshop, then you can make up your mind at the end of it. And hopefully, I've proven to you that the home of the fish is deep water, as, as Buck has proven it many, many times. All right, now we said the home of the fish is deep water, so let's make a distinction between shallow water and deep water. Shallow water is anything from the shoreline or the surface down to a depth of 8 to 10 feet, and deep water is anything deeper than 8 to 10 feet. Now, in the uh, uh, Spoon Pluggers Structure Fishing Guideline, uh, it says that uh, the home of the fish is deep water, and when he's in his deep water sanctuary, he's very dormant and nearly impossible to catch. But we're saved because once or twice a day, the fish become active and they may move towards the shallows. But the bigger he is, the more reluctant he is to leave this deep water sanctuary. As you can see here, when there is a movement of fish that fish goes to, starts leaving this deep water sanctuary, the smaller fish will be out ahead of them. Let's take a look at this picture over here. You've got a, uh, a shoreline bar area here that the locals refer to that as being a hot spot. Well, let's see why it's a hot spot here. You can see that we showed an area of deep water and we got a school of fish in there, so the home of the fish is at deep water. Now we can see that there, there's actually a structure, which is a bar which those fish are going to use and migrate when they leave their deep water sanctuary and move towards the shallows. If the weather and water conditions allow them to go shallow, they will proceed like this. And now these shoreline spots that the locals have called hot spots, and we know why those, that part of the shore is a hot spot, because it's in a migration route on a structure, which we're going to go into much detail later on in the uh, workshop. Now, here's another Buck says, if you have more than 20 feet of water available, the deep water sanctuary will always be below 20 feet. And under average weather and water conditions, this deep water sanctuary will be about 30 to 35 feet or deeper. So here we have, in the case of large mouth bass, this deep water sanctuary for average depth will be around 30 to 35 feet. Now, it could be shallower, it could be deeper, depends on uh, the weather and the water conditions, which we'll, once again, we'll discuss in a uh, further uh, workshop segment. But for the average, we're going to say that the large, the home of the fish for largemouth bass is 30 to 35 feet. In the case of muskies and northerns, 
it's going to be even deeper than that, around 45 feet plus. Now let me clear something up here. When we say that the home of the fish is deep water, it's the deepest water in the area that you're fishing. Let's take a look at this lake over here and clear th this up. When we say the home of the fish is deep water, we're not saying that the home of the fish is in the deepest water in the entire lake. The home of the fish is in the deepest water in the area that you're fishing. This lake here has three deep basins, a 40 foot, a 50 foot, and a 25 foot deep basin. The home of the fish is in the deepest water in the area that you're fishing. So looking at this lake here, we would have probably three different schools or homes of the fish. There would be a, uh, in the north part of the lake, everything around that 40 foot hole, that would be the home of the fish. On the uh, right side of that lake, all the fish would be in that 50 foot hole. That would be their home. And in the south end of the lake, anything in that area, that 25 foot hole would be the home of the fish. So, the home of the fish is in the deepest water in the area that you're fishing. It doesn't have to be the deepest water in the lake. Although, when you're fishing under some tough weather and water conditions, I'd rather fish the 40-foot hole or the 50-foot hole versus the 25-foot hole. Because the weather and water conditions could be where those fish want to be at 30 or 40 feet, and they don't have that in the 25-foot hole. But, the fish that are in that part of the lake, that would be their home. All right, now that we've got that established, that the home of the fish is deep water, now they become active once or twice a day and may move towards the shallows. And we're saved again because the path they take isn't just haphazardly. They follow the bottom features that we call structure to guide them towards the shallows. And in the summertime, the warmer seasons, these structures that the fish will use will be more gradual sloping, as shown here. And in the winter, when the fish become active and move towards the shallows, they're going to look for structures that are steeper. Now also, in the summer months, this is just a general guideline, and it's determined by the weather and water conditions that are present at the time. But for the most part, you can usually expect there to be two movements in the summer. One will be typically early mid-morning, and a second movement late afternoon, early evening. And in the winter, you can typically expect one movement during the, uh, the day, usually midday. But these are general hand rules, and if you have a very bad weather condition in the summer, you may have only one movement. Um, another thing to note is that in the summer, the, the weather is typically more stable, your water conditions are more stable, and the movement period when they do move is going to be for a longer duration versus the winter time. Uh, the movements are going to be not that predictable and they're going to be short and uh, not as predictable as they are in the summer months. All right here's a uh, just a, uh, we talked about being at the right place at the right time and presenting your lures in the right manner. Uh, and when these fish do become active sometimes it's for five minutes. Uh, occasionally you know it, it, this activity period under very stable weather and water conditions could last over an hour, but most of the time when the fish become active, it's going to be five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe 15 at the most. I got this picture up here to remind me of a story. This is going back in, I believe in 1990, I was fishing in northern Wisconsin with my friend Bob. We're fishing this, you know, musky lake. And we started fishing first thing in the morning and we spent all day on his big deep bar, which is probably the best structure on the lake not even a bump on our lure, not even a, a, a bite. We're fishing there all day. We must have been fishing six or seven hours and then the fish finally moved and in five minutes back-to-back -back trolling passes we got two muskies and it was over. That whole activity period was five minutes but we ended up making a nice catch that day because we were at the right place at the right time fishing in the right manner. Uh, now we're going to go over some differences uh, between each species of fish. Uh, the largemouth bass is typically considered a home-bodied fish. What that means is that he'll spend his entire life in one part of the lake. He's not going to roam around or migrate around the lake for the most part. He's going to spend most of his en entire life in one part of the lake. And that especially holds true if he has a good spawning area, he has a nice summer structure and he has a nice winter structure all in the same 
area. He's going to spend his entire life in that area. Whereas other species of fish, such as walleyes and striped bass, uh, white bass, they're migratory fish. Um, they will make a run, if you're fishing a reservoir, they will make a run upstream or up towards the headwaters of the reservoir and they'll be there in the spring and then as uh, it progresses the summer they're going to migrate down the lake and by the end of the summer you'll typically fi find them at the lower end of the lake. And then once late fall comes they'll start making their migratory route back upstream again and do it all over again the next year. And then you have species like muskies and, and northern pike when you have a chain of lakes, it will be common for them to migrate throughout the chain of lakes. Um, usually in the spring or right after ice out, you'll find muskies and uh, northerns uh, in the shallow uh, uh, bays or lakes that have big shallow bays. And then they'll gradually migrate throughout these different lakes too. Uh, you could find them in you know, April and May in one lake and then June and July, they can be in a different part of the lake or, or chain of lakes and then uh, a couple months later the bulk of the fish could be m migrating over a different area. Alright now quick summation. We said that the home of the fish is deep water. He spends over 90 percent of his time in his deep water sanctuary and if you have 20 feet of water available this deep water sanctuary will always be below this 20 foot depth. All right, now we're going to go over some questions that are typically asked when we give this presentation. One question is, what triggers the activity and movements of the fish? Without getting very scientific, Buck has said in his writings that he feels it's a, light a change in a light frequency that triggers the activity periods of these fish. Now, there's no gadget we could go out and buy to measure this light frequency. Uh, it's just Buck's experience on the water for 40, 50 years, he's just picked up on this and Buck got so good that he can actually pick up this change in light and many times he can even predict when the movement will occur. And another thing I like to note here is that this happens for all, all, all wildlife. Uh, you'll notice uh, rabbits and dares certain times a day getting really active where you see them bouncing around and that usually coincides when, when the fish are active too. A lot of times you'll see that correlation between that. A uh, little quick story. One time I was fishing with a, another friend of mine in a reservoir in central Illinois, Cough, Lake Coffeine. We caught a nice movement of bass in the morning. We're out checking some other areas. It's about early afternoon. We see a couple of deer along the shoreline, which isn't a very common sight, especially in the middle of the day. So we pointed them out there and we're looking at these deer saying, wow, that's pretty cool. And then after three or four seconds, we looked at each other and we said, the fish are moving. Let's head back to the, to the spot we caught them at in the morning. We went back over there and they were moving. It was one of the biggest bass catches I ever made. Uh, we caught, I think I was 18 fish, 18 casts on 18 fish before I missed one. That's the best movement I ever had. But there is a correlation between wildlife such as uh, deer and rabbit moving, as well as with the fish. Like I say, it is a certain light frequency that will usually trigger these fish for these activity periods. And another, another th quick thing, which I mentioned a bit ago, these activity periods, sometimes they could last for five minutes, sometimes they can last for an hour and a half. Most of the time, uh, conditions are gonna be tough and it's gonna be, usually under 15 minutes that you get this activity period. And you might get stragglers for a while after that activity period, but this is why, but usually it's gonna be a short time frame. That's why we have to work at being at the right place at the right time to get those fish when they're active. Right. When fish migrate on structure, do they all move the same distance? Uh, no, they don't. Um, the bigger fish, let's take a look at a slide here. Um, the bigger fish, the smaller fish, aren't compatible with the bigger fish. Uh, they're going to become uh, eaten if, uh, if they hang around with the bigger fish. So, um, And the bigger the fish are, the more reluctant they are to leave that deep water sanctuary. So as you can see in this uh, uh, picture here, you know, the smaller fish will usually move ahead 
you know, a little bit shallower than, you know, let's call them the small fish, and then you got the medium sized fish, and you got the large fish. But they'll generally school by size for the most part. And as soon as those big fish decide to move, these smaller fish are going to take off uh, ahead of them into the shallows. If they don't, they're going to become uh, dinner for that big fish. All right? You said when fish are in deep water, they are dormant and non-chasing. Couldn't that be the same when shape when they're in shallow water? Sure. Um, especially if they don't have the depth. If you're fishing a lake that is only 15 feet deep and you have a bad weather condition, these fish may want to be in 30 feet of water, but they don't have that depth available. So their deepest they can go is 15 feet. But he's going to be even more dormant and inactive because he doesn't, he can't go deeper to escape the uh, effects of the uh, of weather condition. Uh, so those fish could be stuck in the shallows because they can't go deeper and they could be more dormant and inactive to catch. Uh, but typically when the fish are in the shallows, uh, they're usually uh, somewhat active and uh, fairly easy to catch, or a lot easier to catch than they are in deep water. We're going to talk a lot more about that further in the workshop when we get to uh, uh, presentation of lures and uh, structure. Do all species found in the body of water use the same structure? All species of fish will use the structure that they have in, in that, when they're in that part of the lake. Uh, like we said earlier, some fish will migrate, but it is very possible that you can have two, three, or, or even four species of fish all using the same structure. Uh, I, I, it's happened to me many times where I've caught walleyes and smallmouth on the same structure or smallmouth and northern pike on the same structure. Uh, just a couple years ago, I was fishing a reservoir in north central Wisconsin called High Falls Flowage, and I caught four species of fish off of one structure within an hour. A walleye, smallmouth bass, uh, northern pike, and muskie. Um, now, some species may move a little shallower than other species, um, and uh, it all depends also on the makeup of the lake, you know, what kind of fish population you have there. But uh, yes, the species will coexist on the same structures. Are fish of all sizes and age groups bunched up together in deep water? Uh, for the most part, they're schooled up by size. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest school of the adult fish, uh, and uh, for the case of largemouth bass, uh, adult fish is anything that's uh, three pounds and over. Uh, probably like anything over 16 inches and higher, those fish are all going to be the, the adult fish and they're all going to, you know, school together. The smaller fish, which we call like the yearling fish, aren't, are going to be a little bit shallower than the adult uh, larger adult fish, uh, but they will typically school by size. Can a fish be caught when they are in their sanctuary? As we said earlier, you can catch a fish any method, any way, any procedure, anyhow, but when you're in a deep water sanctuary, it's very difficult to catch the fish. They can be caught. You put that lure right in front of their face, at the right depth and speed control, which we're going to talk about when we talk about the uh, controls and tools in the next subject here, but uh, the fish can be caught, but usually it's they're extremely difficult to catch. And what we would rather do instead of spending all day trying to catch a fish that isn't active, is just figure out where that fish will show up when he gets active, and that's where we want to spend our time, like that. Uh, story I just said with those muskies. We were spending all of our time on that deep break line knowing that when those fish get active that's where they're going to show up. So you're better off waiting for the fish to become active. All right that wraps up the first part of uh, basic movements of fish. Um, stay tuned and uh, the next part we're going to talk about in this workshop is going to be controls and tools. Thanks for watching.